One moment. We are now live on Facebook. Okay, welcome everybody to Genocost Day. So today, the 2nd of August, we're using this to commemorate um, the many lives that have been lost in the DRC. So I'm going to run through um, the schedule that we're going to be doing today. Um, first, Sylvester Mido is going to be introducing what the Genocost cause is all about. And then we are going to be lighting our candles. So if you are now watching, please prepare a candle. That will be in the next 10 minutes. We will all be lighting our candles together and making dedications for each one. Then after that, we're going to be going through our speakers for today. So that's 16th of June movement. Aidan Inal from the Turquoise Harmony Institute. Christian Sitter, Jean Bisa, Kambali Musavuli. And then we are going to be having some poetry and then we'll be closing the event. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself, Nina Alexia Brazzo. I'm the chairperson of Rahasia Mafusa, and its vision is to bridge a gap between segregated communities as a result of apartheid. So last year was the first time that I decided to collaborate with the Genocost Calls um, in 2019. And now it has grown to collaborate with um, Johannesburg as well as Cape Town and more and more cities around the world. So um, this is not only about bridging gap between segregated communities in South Africa, um, but also internationally too. Um, so I'm very pleased to have this year's event with a more global aspect. Um, we have people that are in Ghana, um, DRC, all over South Africa, the UK, um, Canada, um, Belgium, France, um, United States, and I'm sure many other countries. So welcome everybody to um, today's event. Um, if I can ask people to mute their mics and put their phones on silent, um, and each one of the speakers will unmute themselves um, when it's their turn to speak. So thank you everybody for joining. And now I'd like to hand over to Sylvester Mido, and he is going to introduce uh, more about the Genocost cause. Uh, thank you so much, Nina, and thank you everybody for coming today. Uh, before I start, if this is okay, we are going to be playing the national anthem, and then after that, I will be introducing you to the concept of Genocost. Thank you very much. That was the Debout, Congolais, 
Unis par le sang, unis dans les. Sorry about that. Technical issue. So, thank you very much for coming in today. Um, today, we are the 2nd of August and um, we are here for the general course. And what I'm going to do is give you an introduction uh, to the project, what the general course is, um, how we started, and the, the why we are here. Uh, let me just give me a moment while I'm just getting my slides ready for you guys. Let me know when you can see my screen. Are you okay? Yes. Yep, we can see it. Yeah, okay. we're good here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sylvester and I'm a member of the Congolese Action Youth Platform, which is a, a group, an organization that is based in the UK, but also with members across the world. And uh, we have started the Gino Coast um, in 2013 in London, UK, as the commemoration day for the victim of the genocide in a DRC, okay? So uh, the first question people often ask is, what is genocost? What does the name mean? Well, genocost is a combination of two words, genocide and cost. And the reason why we combine those two words is to emphasize on the fact that at the moment in the Eastern Congo or in the Congo overall, there is a genocide going on uh, that's been ongoing for a long time that nobody talks about. Um, one of the reasons why that and other crime against humanity are being committed in silence is because there is loads of economical interest associated with the genocide of the people in the Congo. And that's been the story of Congo, but also of many African nations where people are killed and exterminated uh, in part because they would like to be able to get, foreign power would like to be able to get access to our resources. So to go back to Congo, um, if you go back in the history of the Congo, back in um, 18, in the end of the, the 19th century, the Congo was actually called the Congo Free State during colonization. And the word free here had nothing to do with the freedom of the people in there. It had to be to do with the ability of people to trade freely whatever resources they had in the Congo. And during that time, Congo, unlike most of the country, wasn't a colony of Belgium, but the private property of Leopold II, the king, who was setting it as a philanthropic mission to bring civilization to Africa. And that is the story that was told to the world and that I was taught uh, as a Congolese growing in Africa. The reality was quite different. Uh, the pictures you see of people with severed hands, women, children, and so on, was the result of Leopold's um, exploitative policy in the DR Congo. He used his control over Congo to be able to build a fortune on exploitation of natural resources such as rubber, um, ivory, and gold. And back in those days, rubber was quite important for the automobile boom. And Congo had, I believe, up to 60% of the world's largest reserve of natural rubber, which made it quite strategic at, at, uh, asset for the King Leopold of Belgium. And this was done by the most cruel of manners. Um, they will often kidnap families and hold them hostage, forcing the men to go and meet an uh, unrealistic quota of rubber. And this picture you're seeing of a man staring at the severed limbs of his child is what would happen when people did not meet the quota. This was colonization according to Leopold, or should I say civilization according to Leopold. And for Leopold to be defeated, he took the word of a few people. Uh, the first one is George Washington William, who was uh, um, one of an African-American who was traveling in the Congo after having heard about the great work that Leopold was doing. When he saw the level of atrocity and cruelty perpetuated in the Congo, he wrote the term uh, crime against humanity to describe what was happening in the Congo. That's the origin of that term to this day was to describe the cruelty and the atrocity happening in the Congo. He was not alone having to denounce that. He was later on followed by others, including Edmond, Fro Edmond Morel, who was a journalist uh, based in Congo at the time, who 
wrote a series of papers um, that caused international outrage uh, in the UK and across the world that forced King Leopold to hand over Congo to Belgium. And that, in a very short manner, was the end of Leopold's influence. However, 100 years later, where are we? The same situation is happening. Congolese are being killed by their millions again because of their natural resources. Uh, back then, it was because of the rubber. Today, it is because of the coltan, which is a mineral used to be able to, provide, to power all of our mobile phone and electronic device uh, with electronic capacitors. So why did we decide to have a Memorial Day? Well, the reason is simple. Congo has had quite an unconventional story. The very fact that there is no monument or no much tell of the history of what has happened to people under King Leopold shows you that no lessons were drawn for it. Um, in most of the nation, you have monuments, you will have the curriculum all written to be able to tell people of the great tragedy of the war of the past or the losses of the past. But in Congo, we have a very different story. And as a result of that, we see the, of not having learned from the past, we are repeating the same history over and over again. So this call for an unconventional approach, which we decided to have a commemoration day. And the reason why we picked the 2nd of August, which marks the beginning of the Second Congo War, is not to say that that's when the genocide and the killing started in the Congo, as I explained, it started much earlier. But it was more to give a point of focus, which is the current killing going on in Congo started around that time. And that is the killing that, according to history book, was finished, or the war that is over since 2003, when the peace treaty was, was created. Well, only last week, for those watching the news, they will know that in Eastern Congo, in Kipu, about 220 people were massacred. And most of our government have remained completely silent about this. And they were not killed by accident. This was no collateral damage of a building collapsing. These were people killed with the most in the most brutal banner with knives and axes and machetes. And these were targeted killings of people wiping up entire communities in key areas that all the population would like to take control of. So this is the genocide that is going on at the moment in the Congo. And these are the crime against humanity that are going on and have been purring for the last 20 years. And you may be wondering, well, what has the rest of the world got to do with it? Well, Congo has always been central or uh, played a key role in key events around the world. Um, people may not know this, but if we often look at Hiroshima and Nagasaki as a turning point for the Second World War, the uranium coming from this bomb were coming from the mines of Eastern Congo. Without Congo in the game, we may have not had that incident. When you're looking at the uh, automobile re re revolution, again, the resources of Congo have played a part. And today in the dot-com revolution, Congo is again at the center of it all. In, in 1999, just to give you a quick example, the price of tantalum, uh, which is one of the key events for the PlayStation 2, which is up to now the most sold console all time, went from $49 per pound to $206. In that period, in Congo, we were having the Second Congo War. Could you imagine the interest or the margin made by the people trading this, which this, this mineral or this material, which at the moment, as you can see, has gone over 200% of its value and what they'll be willing to pay to keep people silent. That should give you a glimpse, a tiny little glimpse of what's at stake in the Congo. And often, the reason why we also use the term general course is because often people like to minimize Congo. You often hear the term tribal when it comes to conflict in the Congo or ethnic war. I personally think that this is a neo-colonial term that should never be used because it is never used when the same happens in Europe. It is a term that um, simplified and almost removed the responsibility and the complexity of the issue. So in the Congo, for example, here is a map where you have the correlation between the resources, uh, the mineral resources, all the tanks, the cold and violence, sexual violence inflicted on women. As you can see, this is not something that is happening at random. There is a direct correlation. If the Congo was as poor as the, the Sahara Desert, there would be no conflict. There would be no millions of rebel groups fighting over that land. So that brings us to the next stage. What can you do about it? Well, 
The Congolese have not remained silent, hoping and begging for order to take a stand for them. As you can see in this picture, both across the diaspora and in the DRC, they have been fighting countless times to try to take a stand against this killing and against the current occupation under which we are on that resulted uh, from the, the end of this, well, the end of the Second Congo War, where we have people who are in power but not able to make decisions that will be benefiting to the people themselves because um, higher power or multinationals are behind influence. So we know from history that King Leopold wasn't defeated using an army. He was defeated using the power of narrative, the power of media by a person, simple person, simple journalist like Edmund Morrell, who at the time was lucky enough to have access to the press. But today in 2020, we all have much more power, far more reach on our mobile phone. We can tell a story, share it to the whole world to see on Twitter, Facebook, and all over the world. And we want to get that power of sharing the story uh, to be able to get the narrative going so that finally peace and justice may be brought back. We're not saying that remembering them will bring peace or justice, but it will lay down the foundation that we need to be able to find a solution. We need to, first of all, identify things for what they are. And in the Congo, what is happening is a general cost. People are being killed, people are being slaughtered because some people would like to make a fortune out of rocks under the ground. And for that, they would like to kill anybody that lives on the land. The aim of our campaign is that the generation of today and tomorrow may be able to learn from the future. And the future, we would like to see, as you can see on the screen, this is something called Place de la Victoire, which is a monument in DRC dedicated to the victory made by the soldiers that contributed to World War II. We would like to be able to have a monument for the victims of the King of Leopold. We would like to be able to have a monument and roads named after the victims of the Genocide, because that will be an important step to make sure that even if we don't find necessarily a solution today, at least some justice is being done and that the future generation may learn and not make the same mistakes again. So I would like to thank you. Without further ado, I know I've gone over my time and there's a lot to be said, but I would like to thank you further uh, again for coming today and joining us today and invite you today to share with us a moment of silence as we light a candle in the memory of many like the ones you see on the screen who have died wanting to have a better future for our nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sylvester. So now's the moment that everybody can collect their um, candles. Um, so especially the um, speakers and everybody can have it so that we can light it virtually um, together. Um, and one by one, we're going to be lighting six candles. So we light these candles to dedicate to those we've lost. We originally have six candles to symbolize the six million we have lost. That number is actually no longer relevant as those statistics are from 1998 until 2008 which are now outdated as the genocide has continued. Please prepare your candles and we will read the dedications whilst lighting each one. After our candles have been lit, we will ask for a minute of silence. So the first that will light the candle are the 6th of June movement and they are going to read their dedication. To the millions we've lost through the long history of genocides and who have died forgotten by history. Christian Sitton. To the millions we have lost to salvation and illnesses unable to be fed or from our perspective, we highlight the candle. To the millions we've lost displacement and homelessness, all the refugees outside of our borders and those internally displaced 
for start of the home. I would like this candle. Aideen Inau from Turquoise Harmony Institute. To the millions we've lost to enslavement and violent exploitation of our land. And I like this candle. John Bistra from Rights to Live Africa. John. Yeah, currently on mute. To the millions we've lost to political oppression because they were too bold enough to stand for our rights to equality and freedom. I light this candle. A last candle of hope to the millions who are still ongoing struggling in our troubled land and working tirelessly for a brighter future. I like this candle. Let's have a minute of silence to remember all those on this memorable day. Thank you, everybody. We'll now hand it back over to Sylvester Meadow, and um, Joe can also share some words. Um, Joseph Abamba Asenga is going to be the co-host for this event. Um, so you're welcome to introduce a little bit more about the course and the significance of Jenna Costa. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Joseph Abimba Singer. I'm also a member of the CAYP group and uh, I Congolese um, residing in the United Kingdom. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for joining us today uh, in this uh, very special day for the Congolese community in uh, remembrance of um, our people whom we've lost, not just uh, throughout this genocide that we've had in the last uh, 25 years or so, but also as a way of remembering the millions we've lost throughout um, the brutal reign of uh, uh, the Belgian king and throughout all the colonial era. So uh, this is a special time for us and we're very, very appreciative of everybody who's joined us today and of every person who is going to speak today. We really, really appreciate your, your contribution and um, just one, Final word is that even though we, we haven't seen 
most of the results of what we're doing today, we believe and firmly believe that we're laying the foundations for the future. And um, do not be uh, disappointed in terms of results and uh, justice being implemented in the Congo today. We just see ourselves as people who are laying the foundation and the future it will remember us from this uh, point on. So thank you very much. And we look forward to the rest of this evening. I'll now pass over to Sly to say a few more words uh, before we carry on um, with our speakers of the day. I believe that, thank you, Joe, for, for saying, uh, some, giving some words of encouragement. And I want to thank you all once again for coming today on this very important day. Um, and I want you to not underestimate the importance of this symbolic gesture in terms of helping to raise awareness and, and helping to find a solution to what is happening at the moment in Congo. So I would like to now pass on to Nina to the next speaker. So the um, first speakers for today are the 16th June Movement. The 16th of June Movement is an organization dedicated to the strengthening of civil society. They believe that strong civil society and civil institutions are vital to South Africa functioning. They look to the legacy left by the people's courts, the mass movements and the community policing that took place in the government-less areas of South Africa in the 1980s for inspiration. To this end, they pursue projects like this that will increase the level of power and self-determination wielded by communities. They also have a particular interest in community safety initiatives and have been involved in a minor project at UCT and an ongoing one in Elsie's River with various technological innovations that will aid communities in self-protection and self-policing. They also have a passion for uniting the public, private and academic spheres of society for the common good and for fulfilling the goals of pan-Africanism by working with nationals of other African countries. We have Devlin Sufo, who is an activist and one of the leaders and founders of the 16th June movement. He is co-founder of the African Way coffee shop, which is where we held a series of events at the beginning of this year for Road to Genocos. And he is passionate about Pan-Africanism and the education about apartheid. Then we have Alia Banwari, she holds a Bachelor of Social Science and Anthropology Honours from UCT. She is currently completing her Masters in Public Health. She has been involved in numerous projects, which are um, through organisations such as Interfaith, um, Ayanda, Kutia, Ashrama, and has been a part of the leadership structures of other, others like Amnesty International, UCT, and the UCT Humanity Student Council and the 16th of June movement. She is dedicated activist with a passion for Africa, women and LGBTQIA rights. I will hand over now, Devlin and Alea. Thanks so much for that introduction, Nina. Um, so as uh, Sly mentioned at the beginning of um, this presentation, he explained that Africa was and is used for its, prim its, its primary resources and Africa should be understood to be a gigantic union. So as long as some of uh, or some countries are exploited and used, for example, the Congo being plundered and being thrown into chaos, the rest of us will never be treated fairly. If South Africa demands that its miners be treated fairly um, and be given fair prices for its gold, then Europe will simply move on to uh, move its business to another country um, to exploit. Even if all Africa demands this, Europe will still reject this because they will plunder the chaotic areas where, or they will cause unrest in areas so it will be chaotic so they can exploit those areas. 
all of Africa is built on resource economies. And so we're all linked together by this dilemma. All of Africa is free or none of it will ever be. And the Congo is a special case with the, uh, within Africa. It is the most resource rich country in Africa. And those who have sought peace for the Congo have been systematically murdered and silenced, leaving either chaos or the corrupt who are happy to aid and abet Europe for their own personal gain. So maybe you can explain this to me. What incentive does Europe have to treat us fairly for our resources when 90% of what they're getting, um, they're getting as blood diamonds or gold for, for, for the Congo, for example, and they're getting it for next to nothing? Well, the Congo is the heart of Africa, and it's been traditionally considered this in Pan-Africanist thought for a long time. It has the riches to industrialize the entire continent of Africa, and the exploitation of the Congo is holding the entirety of Africa back. It's no reason, it's no coincidence that Pan-Africanists like Thomas Sankara, Nelson Mandela, and Kwame Nkrumah have all spoken passionately about the Congo and have always involved itself in their affairs. We should also not be blind to the fact that the one man who came closest to creating a peaceful Congo, who advocated for exactly the kind of thing we're talking about here, was murdered by the Western world. I understand from talking to many Congolese that Patrice Lumumba is a controversial figure in the Congo, but that doesn't change the fact that he advocated for industrializing Africa and using Congo's fortune for good and ending the exploitation by the West. Mumba's assassination should remove any doubt in anyone's mind that the Congo is the key to Africa. The Western world saw it just like we do and they murdered him for it. So as you know, we are the 16 June movement and we've built our entire organization on what we believe are the steps that are needed to fix South Africa. One of those is a renewed focus on Pan-Africanism and the other is a strong civil society rooted in the history of our struggle. We will not dictate to the Congolese what is needed for their struggle because we're not Congolese. But what we can do is dictate to the rest of Africa because we are Africans. And we can say that it's necessary to support the Congolese wherever and however we can. It's necessary to support organizations and initiatives like this one, both because the Congolese are our brothers and sisters and there is no freedom without Africa, without freedom in the Congo. Thank you for your time. Nina, you are mute. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, it's actually Joe who is now. Okay, so thank you so much um, for that contribution there. Devlin and Alea. I just uh, um, wanted to basically open the floor to anyone else who has um, a question to put to Devlin and Alea. Um, if you have any question, you can just uh, ask, it, ask it right away. And just bear in mind that it needs to be slightly short in terms of time because uh, um, we'll, we'll, be, we'll have another session to ask questions later on at the end of the session. Anyone with a question? I don't have a question, but I do have a, a comment. Just want to say, you know, um, we appreciate the, the work that you do and your, your initiative. And it's quite in, important. I believe that we, we have a, a Pan-Africanist approach to, to, to the question. And like, you, like you're doing with Africa, when it comes to, you know, African resources and us making the most out of, of what we got. So, you know, Whatever is happening in South Africa, we are linked. You know, the Congo and the South Africa, technically, economically, uh, culturally, there, there is a lot of rich, and that's not just unique. So, you know, um, really appreciate having you guys uh, being here today, and also um, the work that you do. So I'll let you, Papa Jean. Thank you so much for inviting us. We really we um, we love being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Just, I just have one simple question to ask. Um, 
In terms of uh, solidarity with the African people uh, residing in South Africa, what do you think um, uh, people in South Africa need to do to promote that kind of solidarity? Because when we talk about Congo being the center of Africa, we also need to talk about solidarity uh, with the Congolese people um, by other Africans, uh, amongst Africans as well. What, what advice would you advise us to, um, to help promote that solidarity? Um, I think uh, one of the issues we have in South Africa is that you can sometimes find South Africans to be somewhat selfish. And one thing that they don't realize often is how much other African countries did for us. Mm -hmm. So one approach that we found very successful is going into the history of the South African struggle and going into just how much African countries went into for us during that time for no real reason other than Pan-African solidarity. If you look at like some countries let Mkonto Wasis were set up full military camps, prison camps even in their countries. They faced economic embargoes from South Africa, which was the richest country at the time. They sometimes, people like Angola faced invasions from South Africa. Mm -hmm. They faced tens of thousands of Africans dying just to help us achieve our liberation. And lots of South Africans, because our education system is so limited, have no idea um, what they have done for us and why we should care about other Africans, both practically for the reasons we've said, and also because we have to return the favor for what has been done for us. I think adding to that, I think lots of South Africans have the mentality that South Africa is almost not a part of Africa, like we're the bottom part of Europe. And I think that's a, a colonial hangover of some sort. And so whenever I speak to people, I, remind, I, I introduce myself as an African. I am an African first. Um, yes, I might be the pro product of like Indian indentured labor, uh, in Indian indentured labor, but I'm I am an African first and foremost, and people must remember that. And in order for me to be an African, I need to help my fellow African people, which means I need to help the Congolese people. And I think that's how we can um, battle xenophobia at its core, at its root. Thank you very much. I think that that's a really wonderful answer. I think it covers, uh, it makes all the Congolese people obviously feel a lot more um, happy that obviously they've got support from the South African people, not just the government, but the actual South African people. Uh, I think we've got a question from uh, Papa Jean. Um, Papa Jean, would you like to take over and ask you a question or contribute? Well, um, both a question and uh, a contribution. Uh, I'll start with the contribution uh, because when you speak about the involvement of the Congo into the liberation movement of uh, South Africa during the struggle, it would be worth to know that uh, Miriam Makeba, Mama Africa, was in the Congo, mm. uh, Yuma Sikela, was in the Congo and many other people were in the Congo. But the other thing that is relevant to mention here, when they started the dialogue for the South African liberation Mandela, it was in Guadalite mm -hmm. in 1982. And this has never been mentioned. And moreover, because as you mentioned it, um, I'm glad that you said that you are uh, from Fees Must Fall. Some of these students, leader students, were some of my students at uh, uh, in high school. So I know some of them, the leadership. So um, it is also worth to know that uh, in 1973, Mobutu had a speech at the UN that Africa would not be free if South Africa is not free. And I think that was the start that also brought into the uh, June 16, 1976, because we wanted that uh, South Africa be free. And as somebody who was working at that time, we used to pay tax so that that money would contribute to the liberation of uh, uh, South Africa. And uh, His Excellency, former president of Zambia, Kenneth Kaunda, at the funeral of Nelson Mandela, clearly stated that Zambia didn't have money 
but Mobutu was funding those who were in exile in Zambia so that they could fight here. And these are issues that I would like you to mention and to put in your syllabus in your curriculum so that we get the South African common citizen to know what happened instead of looking at us as if we were paria that came to steal their land. We didn't come to steal their land. We came here so that we can build together a Cecil Road Road. The development of Africa can only be effective and efficient if the road comes from Cape Town to Cairo. What is blocking us today? It's Kinshasa and the Congo. Thank you. And my question now, are how effective are the leaders of South Africa going to be in solidarity with the Congolese that are suffering for many years while they also have mining interest in the Congo? Thank you. Um, yeah, that, uh, that's a very good question. South Africa is very diverse and I think within, maybe it's not a unique case, but we certainly have a lot of South Africans exploiting other South Africans. I would say maybe even more so than in the rest of the continent. So the kind of South Africans that have mining interests in the Congo also have mining interests in South Africa. Mm. And just as much as they want to exploit in the Congo, they're exploiting South Africans too. They're our enemy and South Africa's enemy just as much as they are yours. Yeah. They're no friends of ours. Um, I mean, I, I remember learning about this and when you, it, it goes back to, everything goes back to colonization, unfortunately. Um, there were settler colonies like South Africa where the colonizers settled down and they, they lived and that's where they would extract resources. And it, in um, the Congo, it was supposed to be just resource extraction because it's landlocked. And so once some people decided to live there and what happens is that the people who become naturalized citizens in South Africa, who are for like descendants of the colonizers, they build these big companies like Anglo-American and De Beers and they have interests in um, resource extraction. And basically it's like Devlin said, um, they are exploiting the poor, both Congolese and South African. And so we need to unite in, against these big uh, conglomerates and say, we will not take this. We will not let you do this. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your contributions. I'm afraid due to time, we're going to have to move on to the next speaker. Um, I really value um, all of your comments and your questions, and I'm sure we can carry on with the discussion um, later. Um, so our next um, speaker is from the Congolese diaspora of Western Cape. Christian Sita Mampuya will be speaking about nation and community building in the face of diversity. So Christian Sita is a native from the Democratic Republic of Congo and is a professional software engineer, politician, human rights activist, and an independent researcher. He holds a Bachelor of Technology in Information Technology from the Cape Peninsula University of Technology in Cape Town, where he held the positions of Secretary General, then Chairperson of the Association of International Students. As a politician, Christian has many years of political engagement at UDPS, political party, where he currently holds the position of provincial chairperson for Western Cape. As a human rights activist and a passionate, of, a, a passionate um, person of his community, um, he will be representing the Congolese diaspora of the Western Cape, where he holds the position of coordinator. He is an independent researcher and he's focused on various research endeavors on leadership, governance, and conflict resolution in Africa. 
Um, CETA was a part of our event at the beginning of the year, Road to Genocost. So I'm very happy to have him a part of our Genocost day. So I'm going to pass over to Christian. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Nina, and uh, uh, good evening to everybody. Um, just a quick correction, because I think there was a mix in terms of the titles uh, suggested that I will uh, touch base on uh, part of this event. Um, today, I will speak about the institutional responsibility uh, toward the ongoing uh, genocide in the DRC. Because as you know, um, whenever you have an organization of, of, of people, you do have a, a number of institutions trying to look after those people. You have at the level of a country, you have an institution like a government and uh, at the level of the continent, we have different bodies, different organizations that try to look at uh, um, uh, African people as a whole. And also at uh, international level, we have bodies like the, the, the United Nations. So I will try to discuss a few things about the responsibilities of these different uh, types of, of institutions as far as the, gen the Congolese gen uh, uh, genocide is concerned. Yeah, uh, starting uh, uh, first and foremost with the DRC government. So um, after the number of research that we have done, and uh, when I talk about the DRC government, I'm not looking at the current administration alone. I'm talking about the administration that was uh, in charge of the country when the Second Congolese War started in 1998. Up until the current administration that we have, we're going to look at them uh, 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 together as the, the government. We have noticed three uh, particular elements when it comes to the DRC government. Number one is, uh, there is a lack of commitment toward uh, the very cause that we we, we kind of uh, are talking about uh, today. It's very sometimes uh, heartbreaking to notice that almost no government official would go on public TV or public forums just to to, to talk about the millions of of, of Congolese, uh, the way they are being brutally murdered, and uh, even to come up with some of the means and ways that they would like to address that issue. So this is has been quite shocking to us, and part of the organization where I am at the uh, uh, Congolese diaspora, we've been trying to push for over the years so that we can have some responsibility at the government level, getting involved, start talking about these issues, start pushing even for our genocide to be internationally recognized. Uh, so, uh, secondly, uh, there is a little to no uh, um, interest that you will see from the government. And also do, do not pay interest in terms of the various reports that have been published by different organizations, namely, uh, all of us, we know about the mapping report that was published by the United Nations and a number of reports that came from the Human Rights Watch. You have also quite credible reports coming from the International Study Group on the Congo. So if you look at those various documents, you could see that there are quite reliable, well-sourced information that the government should have made use of in order not only to address the problem, but also try to get different authors or people who are responsible to be brought to justice. But up until as we are uh, speaking, that very late has been done in, in, in that uh, particular uh, 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 problem. And also, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, also uh, enough information that have been made public when it comes to the involvement of, of, of uh, government officials and even military officials. Unfortunately, what's going on in Congo, it cannot only be blamed on the neighboring countries, but also internally, when you look at the government, there are officials, there are politicians who are still instigating the, the massacres of our people. Uh, those politicians have got like very strong ties to militias, to rebel groups who are still uh, are killing in the Eastern part of the DRC. So now, uh, when we, we, we leave the country, we, we, we're going to sit at the continental, you know, at the level of Africa. There also we have a number of institutions that we believe strongly have responsibility towards what's going on there in the, uh, uh, in the DRC. When we start first with, with SADC and, um, and the African Union, I don't know if you are aware of the fact that 
uh, uh, countries from uh, countries like South Africa here and even Tanzania, they do have their military as part of what they have called the International Brigade for Rapid Intervention in the DRC. Yes, they have helped to push uh, one of the rebel movement, which is the M23, but those uh, militaries, they're still stationed there in DRC while they are witnessing powerlessly the killing of, of civilians. And um, you look at a very important instrument, which is the Addis, uh, Addis Ababa uh, Accord uh, that was sponsored by the, the economic community of Great Lakes uh, uh, countries. Uh, uh, this important instrument that is at the continental level has never been uh, fully implemented because if it were, at least we could have witnessed the, uh, a, a very uh, substantial drop in terms of of neighboring countries getting involved in the DRC. Not far from like uh, two or three weeks, there were even credible reports saying uh, close to five countries uh, around the DRC have their armies within our national territory. Those armies are operating there. We do not know what they are doing clearly and those their presence is never been official. If you try to talk to the current government, they will try to deny that we do not have those uh, uh, those armies, but they are there, they are operating. But if you look at the content of that, this uh, uh, Ababa uh, piece of code, you'll see that such a thing couldn't happen if there were uh, mechanisms in place that were quite strong and efficient to prevent the interference of, of neighboring countries into the problems that is going on within the DRC. So now I will, uh, try to end my my talk with the, the the international level where we have the international community, and there we have uh, the mother body of all, which is the United Nations. Um, uh, uh, it's quite important to highlight the fact that the United Nations has got the biggest uh, uh, peacekeeping mission in the world that is stationed in the DRC for over then uh, two decades. That's a very long period of time. You cannot have like uh, uh, thousands of soldiers stationed in, a, in just one part of a country, a couple of provinces that are concerned, but still unable to prevent the killing of civilians while the clear mandate is even to protect these very civilians from being the, uh, uh, attacked from, uh, from militias and, and other rebel groups. So apart from that, uh, UN officials were even reported to be now involved into some business dealings. Some of them have got, if you do, whether you believe or not, uh, they've got like mine, mining site in the DRC, where they are mining and they're getting our minerals out of the country, obviously illegally, because they are not there to do business, they are there to protect the people. And nothing has been done, and not even uh, uh, the UN sending a mission just to to kind of try to verify these allegations, and this like led us to believe there is a, a lack of interest. You see, the, the international body is not much interested into finding a lasting solution in the DRC. At the continental level, they will propose very valuable solutions, but never implemented correctly. And at the national level, we still have a government that is not showing us very convincing signs of, of, of a responsible government that is there to protect the people and that is doing everything to protect the people. When it gets reported that a, a government official or military officials are involved in those massacres, you'll see the government will go, will investigate, will do everything until the, the, the truth comes out and take you know, the proper measures or the proper sanctions against those who are perpetrating the, the, the killings uh, of, of, of our people. So these are, in a nutshell, those are three uh, sectors where we believe these uh, important uh, institutions have tremendously let down the Congolese people, especially in the eastern part of, part of the country. I uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, brother Mr. Mampuya. Uh, I'd like to welcome any questions on the floor, please, for or any, any proposals or suggestions for Brother Christian to answer. Are there, uh, yeah, Mr. Sly, would you like to take over and ask the question? You mentioned something quite important there, the fact that uh, the UN had its largest peacekeeping mission in, in the Congo. Uh, for over 20 years and the, stealing, the killing is still ongoing. Um, 
why, what kind of, uh, is there any way that does the UN have any sense of accountability for their failure in the DRC? Because if you have various reports of them failing and it's been changing over the years, um, is there any anybody at all that the, the people of Congo could go to if they wanted to get a, accountability from the UN? In, how does this work institutionally? Yeah, um, uh, unfortunately, the way UN works is quite uh, difficult to grasp. And uh, uh, since they've been having their mission, I think a credible report have been published even submitted to uh, those who are making decisions within the, the, the UN as the body. But the problem, I think, and uh, within our organization, we are the view that the very mandate of, uh, of UN was uh, ill-conceived. It looks like they, will, they are there to protect the people, but they will take actions against the rebels only when themselves they are under attack. To us, it doesn't make sense. How can you be there protecting the civilians and you will take action against the rebels only uh, when you as, as, as UN soldiers are under attack? It does not make sense. We believe they could have gone into those different villages where the rebels are operating uh, in order, first of all, to, 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 to protect those villages. And number two, they must have a more proactive uh, 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 approach, meaning that they can track down those rebels. It's not like those rebels are moving from country to country. It's just one part of the country where those rebels are located. Even if we have the forest there, most of those uh, uh, those uh, soldiers, they come also from countries where they have uh, fought uh, wars within soldiers, uh, namely uh, uh, Brazilian soldiers who are still in the DRC. I think there, there is a, a, a fundamental problem with the way they have conceived the mandate of the UN peacekeeping mission in the DRC. Thank you, Brother Christian. I've got one question. Uh, this is for you, but this is actually for everyone else who, um, who actually for the, is a member of the diaspora. And what do you think the Congolese diaspora can do to influence uh, the good, a good leadership in the Congolese political life? Well, uh, what the diaspora can do is first uh, and foremost is to get involved. Personally, I don't share the opinion where the diaspora will stay outside, you know, just campaigning, going to uh, world institutions, complain and raise awareness, which is very good. Uh, part of what we are doing today, having this type of dialogue, is raising awareness. It's something that is spreading the news about the general cause. It's very positive. I, I, I got no issue with that. But if you, you ask me where the diaspora can be more effective is to get involved because at the bottom of everything that is happening is the way the country is governed it's when you look at the different national institutions so you you you, you will see uh, most of the diasporas we kind of tend to stay outside of of our political arena you know thinking that is something wrong to get involved politically because you're going to end up being corrupted because you're going to end up being subjected to some uh, political dogmas that's not the case but if we come like a, a independent figures do, and we get involved into the very political arena of the drc with our different view of things different appreciation of the, the reality and the, 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 the vision of doing things differently, I believe five, year, uh, five years from now or 10 years from now, we will now see a more responsible government responding to the needs of the people. And luckily, maybe we're not gonna talk about any other massacre still uh, you know, affecting, uh, inflicting our, our people. Thank you, brother. Um... Just bear in mind, we'll have the more. If you have any more questions, guys, uh, you can also ask them. Uh, we will spare some time at the end of the session to ask any more questions. I'd like to pass it over now to Nina to uh, carry on. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, we are running a little bit late, so I'm sure some of you are burning for questions. I saw Jean and some other people with their hands up, uh, but due to time, we, um, we have a nice program, so we have to um, crack on, I'm afraid. So next we have Kambale uh, Musavuli. He's a native of the DRC and one of the leading political and cultural Congolese voices. He's a social entrepreneur and an international human rights um, advocate, 
working with youth groups across the African continent. He writes on issues affecting the people of the DRC and has served for the past decade as the national spokesperson for the Friends of the Congo, a group that raises global consciousness about the situation in the Congo and provides support to local institutions in the Congo. He is currently an analyst at the Centre for Research on the Congo, fo focusing on the role of the fifth Pan-African Congress in Manchester and Ghana's uh, Kwamele Nkrumah, might have said that wrong, sorry about that, played in materialising the decolonization process towards a Pan-African Union. If you followed our Road to Genocost event series, events, you will recognise Kambale from the interview and the film we played, Crisis in the Congo, Uncovering the Truth. If you have not already seen this, please be sure to check it out. I'm now going to pass over to Kambale, who is in Ghana at the moment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nina. Uh, thank you to CAYP for organising this event. I'm sure you know I support it over 100%. Uh, to make sure that in the consciousness of the world, the world knows that there is a genocide happening in the Congo. And initially led by the Congolese themselves who are putting the world on notice. Um, it's also important for us to refocus and really go back to why we have this event. There is a genocide in the Congo, right? And I want you to put yourself in a picture move back to 1942. Think about the Jewish community being on a Zoom call, thinking about what is actually happening to the community in Europe with Hitler. What will be the sense of urgency they would have had to stop the killing of over 6 million people? The Soviets raised the bell. They told the world what was happening. And it took five years until the world engaged and the Soviets went and stopped the fascists. So as we think about that, and I really want us to center back to why this event is so important. It's not just sharing information where just last month, we are speaking about over 200 people killing South Kivu. And most people who may be even joining this call do not know last month over 200 people were massacred in the DRC. So if we speak about the genocide, we need to know that it is happening now. But we're focusing again into the history. I want, us to I want to take us back to August 1998, because we are August 2nd, 1998. And I'm going to read something to you. The excerpt I'm reading is from the UN Mapping Exercise Report published October 1st, 2010, documenting over 617 incidents of mass human rights violation and humanitarian law in the DRC, documenting crimes that have taken place in the Congo from 1993 to 2003. In his page on 176, they are speaking about an incident which according to them is one of the most serious violations of human rights. I read, on 24 August, 1998, ANC-APR soldiers massacred over 1,000 civilians, including numerous women, as well as babies and children in the village of Kilingutwe, Kalama and Kasika in the Mwenga region, 108 kilometers from Bukavu. Before they were killed, most of the women were raped, tortured, and subjugate, uh, subjected to genital mutilation. The massacre was organized as a retaliation following the death on August 23rd of around 23 APR officers in an ambush organized by the Mai Mai on the road between Bukavu and Kindu. Numerous bodies of babies and children were thrown into the latrines. Before they left, the soldiers pillaged three villages and set fire to large numbers 
of homes. August 2nd, 1998, the second invasion of the DRC happens. Then August 24, in one of the incidents document, of course, before that, that page. Yeah, that, all's well. I'm just waiting for the water to get hot. I'm going to have a shower. Sorry about that. Here we are. Yes. So August 2nd, 1998, the second invasion of Congo happened. The report documents more crimes that took place from August 2nd to August 24th. And I've just read that on August 24th, 22 days after that invasion started, a thousand people and mostly women and the many women in that uh, area were raped, killed and, and their bodies thrown away. To remind us of why it's important for us to stop this genocide, because what I just read, many Congolese know this story. But we must understand why it's happening. And at the end, we'll, we'll ask the most famous question, what is to be done? How can we stop it, right? I believe Congolese on the ground have mobilized, have organized to stop the killing. I also believe in the diaspora, Congolese have organized and mobilized. But what is stopping us from stopping this killing? Maybe what I would suggest is for us to think about the struggle of the Congolese, not as a national struggle, but as a global struggle. The moment that we realize that the millions of people killed in the DRC are directly connected to the SpaceX flying back into the world today. I'm sure some of you know that SpaceX uh, from Tesla just flew back. We will understand why. And it's also important in the context of South Africa. Why? Because now we have two South Africans that most people do not know. Elon Musk of Tesla, who is a South African. Glassenberg of Glencore, who is a South African. But they're all foreign passports. So in the case of Elon Musk, even though he's a South African national, he has a Canadian and an American passport. In the case of Glassenberg, he has a Swiss passport and an Australian passport. So you'll never think of them as um, South Africans. But why are the names important? When we speak about and Glencore, right, two companies who have just signed a deal last month to have unfettered access to Congo's cobalt. Tesla did not sign a contract with the government of the Congo to get access to the cobalt. Tesla signed a contract with Glencore to have access to the cobalt. And people will wonder, what is happening in the area in Minembe? What is happening in Tanganyika? There is lithium that's been discovered in those areas. Right? We are not connecting the displacement also of the killing of the people to the wealth of the DRC. And people live on that land. You have indigenous Congolese who've been there for hundreds of years, never benefited from the land. And someday in 1885, the United States and Western nation decided at the Berlin Conference to carve up the Congo and give the Congo to King Leopold as his personal property. And from that time to today, Congolese have been in the struggle to liberate themselves. We have had Simon Kimbangu rose up, who spent 27 years in jail, longer than Mandela, fighting for a free and liberated Congo. They were so afraid of Simon Kimbangu that put him in jail, and he died in jail. We had Lupumu II, the king of the Basonge and the Tetela, who stood up against King Albert I, asking him to leave the Congolese people alone and give back the land, Likamboyama Bele. This is our land. He was hung in front of his people. And elders have told me that there is a huge possibility when he was hung, that Patrice Lumumba in who was born in Katakokombe, was around the hanging because he was hung in front of everybody. We had the movement of liberation of the DRC calling for independence in the 50s, where Gaston Diomi, uh, Galula, and Lumumba 
came to Accra in 1958 as part of the All African People's Conference. While before coming, they were speaking about equality and becoming almost as the managers of the Congo on behalf of Belgians, they met with all the Africans who were totally clear about the struggle of Africa. The young people they met were from Tanzania, from Kenya, of course, Ghana, Kwame Krumah, who told them that Congo was essential to the liberation of the African continent. Even Kwame Krumah wrote it in his book, The Challenge of the Congo. The capital of the United States of Africa, according to Kwame Krumah's plan, was Kinshasa, back then called Leopoldville. And they told these three young Congolese, make sure that Congo is free. And then they went back mobilized and organized, not by themselves, with other Africans. There were Chadians who helped the uh, Parti Solidaire Africain. There were Cameroonians. There was even a woman, a Central African woman, André Bruin, who historically in the Congo is known to have organized 45,000 uh, Congolese women in the Kenge area, had them to sign to become members of a political party. So as I speak to Congolese people, I always say, Congo will not have been independent if it wasn't for Pan-Africanism. It wasn't a Congolese affair. It was a continental affair and there were Africans who worked. From the time of independence to today, we are still in the to struggle to liberate our country. And we must lift up the name of the young Congolese uh, who have fought for the liberation of the DRC. Our Soweto happened on January 19, 2015, the Telema uprising. The Congolese government wanted to pass a law around census. Congolese people outside of political parties, no definition, I am from this party or not, took it to the street, demonstrated for two weeks. The, uh, the city was shut down, internet shut down, communication not going, SMS not going anywhere, and many of them died. But they were successful at stopping the system. They did not pass that law. But we know 400 young Congolese died. How, why do I say that very forcefully? Because if you are Congolese, you know that in March of 2015, there was a mass grave discovered in Maluku with 400 bodies. Those are the Congolese freedom fighters we have to mention. The Teres Kapangala, the Luke Tungulula, the Rossi Chimanga, the Armand Tungulu, who have continued to fight for a free Congo. So we cannot say that Congolese are not fighting. We cannot say that they haven't won. I show a few victories of what we've done to get to where we are. But what we fail to realize is what Kwame Nkrumah said, that Congo's challenges are both internal and external. That we can fight the, the forces inside of the Congo, the bourgeois, the elites in the Congo, but their power doesn't come from Kinshasa. Think about it. Congolese people voted. They voted in 2006, they voted in 2011, they voted again in 2018. Do you believe that the Congolese today believe in those results? So if the Congolese people cannot choose their leaders and we are focusing in changing the system based on those who are in power, then we are saying that Congo will still be in bondage for decades. But if we say, Elon Musk does not care about his nationality. He's a South African with white monopoly, uh, monopoly capital, with an American and Canadian passport, same thing with uh, Glassenberg. They, they don't consider themselves South Africans. So they're able to mobilize international to bring capital to destroy not just the Congo, but different parts of the world. Elon Musk just say that we will coup whoever we want speaking about Bolivia. Can you imagine a CEO of a corporation say that, getting Congo's cobalt? So Congolese, as we fight to liberate our country, how will we see the struggle of the Malian people today who are demanding the right to have a leadership that represents them to be our fight? How will we be outraged to hear that in South Africa, right, that you have shark dwellers who are being killed Jews, like people, are being displaced all over Kinshasa in their lands. They are fighting also to get, gain control of the land. When we start seeing our struggle as a Pan-African struggle, it's easier.
And I will end so that you know, we engage more in a discussion to come back to what I started with. I started with the UN Mapping SSS report. It was released October 1st, 2010. This October is 10 years later. This report says that what is happening in the Congo are war crimes, crimes against humanity, and possible genocide if proven in the competent court. We have a document that has 617 incidents. Can one Congolese today on this call or allies who are also on this call just say, I will focus on pulling up one incident and making it known to the world, just as I share with you, I pulled the date, I read what the UN mapping exercise report has said and educate people about this report. And this report did something very important for us. Right? This report proposed solution for transitional justice. One of them being an international tribunal for Congo. What most of the civil society have shared is that they would like to have a mixed court, a court with Congolese and African uh, and international judges, right? Lawyers who have worked at the International Tribunal of Rwanda, who have been in that trip, have shared with me as a Congolese, say, Congolese, as you build and you get your tribunal, make sure that the archives that are in the International Tribunal for Rwanda is not transferred to Kigali, but is transferred to your courts because there are evidence that's in those archives that's going to be essential for the crimes committed in the Congo. Because the rebels who committed crimes in Rwanda, in Uganda, are the same ones today who are committing the crimes in the Congo. You don't have to actually quote me on it. I can show you a fact. The so former first, minister, I noticed I have three minutes. So the oh, former yes, yes. Yeah, we're sort of like running a little bit um, squeezed on time. So if you, if you uh, can give you a couple of uh, minutes to sort of wrap up. Uh, and then we yeah, I think, um, um, yeah, because we're running over, maybe Jay, you want to ask your question? And then we'll move on to the next speaker because uh, of time. Uh, yes, I had a question on, on the setting up of the Tribunal for Congo. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, um, Obviously, we've established that there's a link between the mineral exploitation and, and the genocide in the Congo. What, to what extent do you think the setting up of a tribunal uh, for the Congo will actually um, achieve uh, social justice for the Congolese people? Aside from just obviously like uh, uh, condemning a few, uh, just a few big people rather than um, achieving justice for the Congolese people. It will be up to us Congolese, as long as we don't transfer responsibility for making sure that justice is given, uh, we will not get it. We do have models in Africa where justice was given. So when you look at the, tribe, uh, the tribunal that was created to try Habre of Chad, uh, the people on the ground feel some sort of justice. That's really the essence. Any justice process where the Congolese people in the end of the process feel that justice has been provided will be successful. And what they have called for is the International Tribunal uh, for Congo with a mixed court. And we must make sure it's not just individuals, the report is clear. It's individuals, corporations, and nations are liable to what has happened in the DRC. We young Congolese have that mandate, that historical duty to make sure that justice is served to the Congolese people. Uh, thank you so much for that contribution. Um, We'll carry on a little bit at the end of the session with any more questions. I'd like to pass over to um, Nina now to carry on uh, to, with the other uh, guests. Nina? I would like to ask Kambele one question before we move on to the next, um, which is South Africa's role. We, um, obviously we've spoken previously a little bit about SADAC. Um, maybe you can speak um, what you feel uh, the South African civil society and the institutions here can do more to support um, what's going on in the DRC. My hope is that we'll use the approach of BDS when it comes to DRC. I'll give uh, share with you an example. I'm sure many of you in South Africa are still eating Nando's. But every time you eat Nando's, you should know you're supporting Kabila. Because Bloomberg has already published a report listing 82 companies 
one of them being Nando's as part of investments uh, that Kabila has put to keep his power. So the report is there. So building the civil society in South Africa will be maybe having a research group, pulling up the information on what are the companies in South Africa implicated? We have the Glencore, I just mentioned Nando's, there are many others. I mean, even executive outcomes, the mercenary group was based in Johannesburg, I think they're defunct now. Uh, they used, they were hired as mercenaries in the 1996 war. We need to find a CEO of those companies because people die. So building around that solidarity uh, is important. Uh, second is to also know that while we are supporting the Congolese in South Africa, we have two types of Congolese. We have the bourgeois in Senten, and we also have the working class who are struggling, right? that some of the bourgeois Congolese in South Africa are part of the elite that's also exploiting. They are the one also cutting the deals. So it's also to have the understanding of class that not because I'm called Congolese, it means that I'm actually working and fighting for the interest of the Congo. And many of the Congolese elites have properties and investment in South Africa. So we must build a solidarity. Um, and we have had it historically, and I hope that we can rebuild it. Is it okay for me to, to ask? Sure, thank you. Um, we're actually going to have to move on, I'm afraid, because we've got several more speakers. Um, but maybe you can post your question in the Zoom group. All right, and then we right. can see your question at a time later. Cool. Thank you. Um, thank you for, um, Kambale, for mentioning the very valid point that no matter your nationality or your background, this is about um, justice. Um, we're now going to move on to Aidin Inau, who is from the Turquoise Harmony Institute. Um, he was born and educated as a physics teacher in Turkey and moved to South Africa in 1998. He was involved in establishing an educational trust, which currently run a number of schools in South Africa as nonprofit organizations. He served at these schools as a teacher and also a principal. He is currently serving as the regional director of Turquoise Harmony Institute in Cape Town. He has recently complete, completed his PhD thesis in philosophy of education and awaiting his results. On the 31st of August in 2019, Turquoise Harmony Institute organized a symposium entitled Education in the Fourth Industrial Revolution, Challenges for Social Cohesion and Citizenship, where we organized the important perspective from the Congolese um, group that was supported by the uh, Genocos campaign with presentations explaining the negative effects of the people of the DRC in each industrial revolution, including this one, the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So now I'm very happy to introduce um, Aidan in our to be a part of the Genocost Day. I will pass over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nina, and the organizers uh, of this event. I've been listening, uh, um, trying to listen to carefully or, and gain some insight into what is happening. Uh, I have done little of research before the event on what's happening in Congo, etc. So, uh, yes, uh, we, and the speeches that uh, we just listened, um, obviously it's very important that, that we focus on conflict resolution, perhaps in, in some sense. Uh, but the work that we do as Turquoise Harmony Institute, which is an NGO based in South Africa, I am running the uh, Cape Town office, um, of Turquoise Harmony Institute. I think yeah, the work that we do falls more under the conflict prevention category because we, uh, we, we, um, we believe that it's about lack of knowledge and lack of acknowledgement of each other, which leads uh, uh, to small and big conflicts. And <clears throat> I think it boils down to uh, some kind of an education as well, both at the school level and at, at the public education level, um, because the lack of such education and lack of uh, knowing one another 
And that knowing one another includes appreciating each other's humanity and dignity uh, leads to manipulation by um, various groups and, and role players. And I think what, uh, he, what we are seeing here is, uh, is, is largely part of that. Manipulation by some people, some groups, parties, leaders, whatever you want to call it, uh, to, uh, to preserve a status quo so that they can continue with their agenda. So the kind of work that, that we, um, so the, the, the kind of work that we try to do is to, as, as you can see from our motto that's behind me, our motto is so we may know one another, which is inspired by a verse in the, in the Muslims holy book Quran, and where God says we've created you in tribes and nations so you may know one another. So the purpose uh, basically of human existence is about knowing one another. And as, like I said, that knowledge of the other starts with the very basic definition of knowledge, uh, acquiring uh, uh, the basic information about each other. But then again, that knowledge also goes on to, to appreciating each other's humanity. And that each other's humanity, I think uh, is important that, that we, we give every human being the due dignity. Uh, as we learn from the concept of Ubuntu, uh, uh, that I'm sure you, most of you know quite well. Um, I think um, the once once pe when people don't know one another, that leads to uh, to naming and categorizing the others according to various uh, agendas and categorizations. And unfortunately, in cases of uh, violence, especially uh, the the situation of a genocide, we see this kind of categorization quite a lot. We see people almost being uh, sort of uh, being categorized as non-humans. They they are not seen as human beings. So that, that genocide, that killing one another, it becomes so easy. And that is uh, that has happened in so many parts of the world. It has been committed by almost all nations, almost all religions, and all ethnicities. And therefore, I think as humanity, uh, as the as the entire human race, we are guilty of all the genocides and all the killings that happened all over. And therefore, perhaps we, we need to, uh, we need to first sit down and acknowledge each other once again, that each and every human being is important. A, a child who, who is uh, a girl that, who has been raped in, in Congo is just as important as, the, as somebody who has been killed in the United States or in some way in Europe. So I think, as long as we don't reach that kind of understanding, uh, these atrocities will continue to happen for the years to come. And therefore, I think uh, without uh, talking too much, uh, instead of trying to, uh, to resolve conflicts, we, we try to focus on prevention of conflicts before they happen by uh, promoting or inviting people to, to, get, to come together and start discovering each other's humanity and really give the due dignity uh, which has been bestowed upon each one of us through creation uh, and, and that is a, and that is only possible by people knowing one another and people appreciating that it, it's all about humanity i think uh, the major issue here we can start and start uh, the, we can we can discuss obviously the conflicts have reasons their backgrounds etc but I think the main re this is a human it's a human crisis. We're facing a human crisis today, and that human crisis manifests itself as a genocide in one place, then killing of uh, Floyd in the U.S., and then killing of someone else in another country. And I think what, what is striking about what we are discussing today is that it's some we are, we are talking about something which is ongoing, which is happening now today. And I, um, something that I always believe in is that uh, it, it's always uh, Attractive and, and good to talk about um, to uh, to talk about what happened in the past and to venerate the heroes of the past and to curse the evils of the past. But it's important to to look at what's happening now, wherever it's happening, and just and do something about it. Because and I don't think uh, um, 
we, we, we have to wait for future generations to lament what's happening today. I think we, we have to start today, try and stop what's happening so that the future generation, generation don't have to uh, host such programs. And they can, they can rather focus on celebrating the, uh, our achievements in, in, in preventing conflicts. I think uh, that, that's, uh, I don't want to take too much of time uh, for the sake of, uh, um, for the sake of everyone. So thank you very much for giving me uh, this platform and I wish uh, the campaign all the best. And thank you to each one of you to, to the great work that you do. Thank you, Aydin Inal, for that contribution. Um, we're so running short on time, so uh, I'll ask one question and um, hopefully we can, um, we can sort of keep a few more, more questions for later on. Uh, I've got one question in terms of uh, what do you think we can do um, on a Pan-African level to sort of like uh, organize any conferences um, for, for all the different societies to kind of meet regularly? Okay. Well, um, obviously, obviously our focus is primarily in South Africa, but I think that the main recipe is the same to, uh, to bring people together. Obviously, it's not very possible at the moment because of the, uh, the pandemic. But uh, once uh, post-COVID-19, or even now in different platforms, we, we don't have to wait for that. But like such platforms on online platforms, social media is a great tool. If we can use it instead of sharing all kinds of information, we can share this sort of uh, uh, information. You know? uh, and I think uh, the greatest empowerment is knowledge. Uh, spread the knowledge, let people know what's happening. And then uh, people will start it's a very slow process. I mean, uh, like, like it was said earlier, I was born in Turkey and currently in Turkey, we are facing uh, it's another person, perhaps a genocide in the sense of killing people, but we're also facing some serious human rights abuses and, and targeting some people uh, uh, with their wealth and et cetera, et cetera. There's many things are happening. So what in my experience the greatest thing that we can do is to share the information and let people know what's happening and people today or tomorrow or sometime in the future will realize that what is happening is, is an atrocity. I think spread the word that's what we can do. Thank you so much brother for that contribution. Um, yeah just keep writing any questions you have on the chat so we'll pick them up uh, towards the end of the session uh, we can discuss them later. I'd like to pass over now to Nina to carry on, please, Nina. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if I can ask Aidan one last little question um, because of the work that I know so wonderfully that they do. Um, what do you think the role is of the interfaith community um, on the gender cost? Um, campaign and the genocide that's going on in the DRC? Okay. Well, I think uh, South Africa in general is a religious society. I think most people, they do adhere to some religion or some, some form of faith. Um, so I think it, uh, one can approach the faith leaders and, and inform them so that they, that channel can be used to spread the information. And uh, one of our core beliefs is that each faith in essence, uh, preaches uh, peace and harmony. But uh, it, it's us as human beings. We, uh, we manipulate them to strengthen our own agendas. But, so if we can appeal to the faith communities and really get, the, get them on board, I'm sure they will be a great channel in, in terms of spreading this, uh, uh, the message. Thank you. Um, did you explain the slogan that you have behind you? Did you share uh, yes, that? Yes, I did, yeah. I, th I, I, I think I spoke about it, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much, um, Aidan. Um, I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, um, Jean Bressois. Um, he has been involved with quite a few projects that I've been doing um, with Genocost. Um, and also a webinar series, if any of you have been watching that. 
um, he has been an amazing contribution to that as well. Um, so there is so much of a biography that I can share about Jean, but because of time constraints, I'm not going to go through all of the aspects that I was going to go over. Um, but what I always like about his bio is it starts with he's primarily a husband and father of four children. Um, he holds a bachelor with honours degree in education, obtained in 96 in his home country, the DRC. And for over 35 years, he has built up an extensive experience, not only in the field of teaching through various institutions in high schools and universities as a junior lecturer, but also as a human rights defender who undertakes the challenges of going to the battlefronts or trenches by assisting other people. He is the founder and chairperson of the Right to Live, which is an organization that undertakes fostering social cohesion and solidarity among the Congolese civil society diaspora, primarily, but also all Africans in general, as well as humans worldwide. The organization envisions to build bridges between cultures whilst also forging transfer of skills through processes that help children rebuild their confidence. Jean is a fellow who is passionate about Pan-Africanism and its renewal for the betterment of all African people. He believes Africa must celebrate its intellectual contribution to the world but also reflect on its shortcomings. He is a motivational speaker whose past in intertwines with the hardships of Africa, but encapsulating the resilience to overcome his difficulty has been most rewarding. So now I believe that we're going to be playing um, a video clip. Um, is that ready first or should I pass to Jean? Hello. It's uh, the video first. Yep. Okay. So you're welcome to play that. Um, whilst um, that's been set up by Sylvester, would um, you maybe like to fill the gap, Jean, with a little bit of background? Or do we, is it fun? Do we have it? From the Congo. Oh. I was born in South Africa with my parents and my three siblings. Um, my father's an educator and my mother uh, just finished her first degree in accounting. And my parents are always worried what might happen to us. For instance, two years ago, um, my brother was still in the DRC while pre and post electoral violence was happening. So they feared that he might get killed. And millions of people were, were killed um, to build uh mining factories and many people had to leave the drc because of all these uh killings that were happening and kids were enforced to go mine without no choice my father he fights for the drc no matter what he would have sacrificed anything for it and he would want just one day to go back home. But he's still really sad that my birth certificate reads alien. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Ladies and gentlemen, that's the voice of my child. 
the voice of an African child like this child that is speaking with you tonight. In my reflection on the 30th of June of this year, when we turned 60 and addressing a crowd of mothers and Congolese people, we are mainly in that cathedral so that we could provide them food, the relief during this COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. I had these words. If you believe Congo is 60 years old, my belief and my conviction is Congo is still a child, a baby, which is looking, who is looking to walk. So we have had no independence. I thank you, Kambale, and I see myself when I was young and talking the way we we're talking about revolution, and I say, wow, that's me. I could stand on the 25th of June, 2017, and say, this man is not going to walk on the red carpet because he's illegal and illegitimate. It's then the new, and thanks, Nina, because I saw that's the picture you chose to put on the on the leaflet. So I was quite surprised. And when you gave me that quote to read, it was also a reflection of the passion of a child who was born parentless, motherless, and fatherless. For 44, 55, 60 years, I've been looking the face of a mother that I don't know just because she was killed, like the mothers that are being killed today in the eastern side of the Congo, like the children that were pounded in a mortar in the eastern side of the Congo. Kambale, you mentioned Maluku, where 450 kids, young people, were buried alive. One of them was here. I could have chosen the storytelling that you wrote, but I will share it with you at a later stage. It is there, we made that story. And the story was, my Congo, my story. That's my Congo, my story is all about the Congo side. That's how we got to meet with Sly Trunina. So today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to reflect about the past. That's the reason for which I had chosen the voice of a child. Thank you for being here and thank you for the opportunity given to me to share with you some thoughts on this platform. I do so as your African brother being joined by our beloved sisters and mother coming today together as a united brotherhood. For me, I side with the many among us who believe in our innermost that if we remain bound by our common ancestry and its values thereof, we can overcome any challenges and uncertainties of any kind that control us daily, including the coronavirus. As we meet today and as we share today, we shall bear in mind that we are not only commemorating and sadly remember the many atrocities that we endured as a community, the brutality and yet indifference we have painfully faced because of who we are and where we belong, the pains and the difference we have encountered and suffer in silence while striving to survive. We are mainly here to remember the wanton, targeted killing of our loved ones. We are here to give a meaning to the lives of those we have, we have been mourning every day. Wherever we are, 
even when we are scattered around the globe, looking for refuge in the unknown, we are the sans papier, meaning people with no identity, no rights, no rights to live. Oftentimes that not, we ask ourselves, or we have to respond to this basic yet ex existential question, why? I hear many of you ask on a daily basis, can human treat us in this way? What have we done? But most importantly, how come humans turn a blind eye on our suffering, even when we have not engaged anyone in a conflict at all? Have we? It is also worth mentioning that the whole world is in turmoil. This is the appropriate pause to seek peace globally as progressive forces. We must speak with one voice for that purpose. Peace, clean, and transparent government. I have heard those words so many times, but have they applied to the Congo? Dear brothers and sisters, whatever the mean world think or does, today event, our fathering is proof enough that we will no longer blindly accept and tolerate seeing our people and friends murdered, mutilated, buried alive, our daughters and mothers brutally raped and dehumanized, our families and friends assaulted and locked up without any hope of the slightest human rights. Our children and youth taken away from education and society. Our men ashamed, debased, and estranged. What has changed in the past centuries? At least in the 17th centuries, we had a value. We were traded as objects. Today, we simply do not exist. Why is this so? Why is that we African brothers and sisters are treated by our leaders as valueless? We have no value. I feel sad, very sad as I stand here in front of you and in anger to as I remember that even after 22 years, 60 years of a violent but silent genocide, no one is prepared, willing, or even acknowledging the Congo site. Sly called it Congo Ost, Congo, Congo Coast. I called it Congo site for many years. Yes, in silence we cry, in silence we die. Is Congo side or Congo host not the death of people? No later than a fortnight ago, you mentioned it, Kambali, in Kipupu, Kivu. I only see one Kivu. I don't see three Kivu. For those who see, three Kivu, that's your problem. As a nationalist, I see one Kivu. And 220 people were killed as usual. The assailants are said to be unknown and invisible, probably protected and hidden in the safe area of those who operate in the dark background. Has this made the news? at all, whether in DRC, Africa, Turquoise Harmony, do you know that they killed 222 people? Africa at large, where honest reporting is said to be a norm. No, no words. In other words, was it reported in the Congo news? No. Was it reported in the international news? No. 
Was it even mentioned at the United Nation? The answer is no. Did our president even cite it or kept a minute of silence? No. Why the silence? Why this omerta? Is it because we are by nature a peace-living people? Peace-loving people? Yeah, they know us for our dance. They know us for our bright colored shirts. That's the reason for which I'm wearing wine. Congo side, Congo coast, Congo host, do the term matters. It all started in 1960 and gradually, sorry, sorry, probably. Right, Papa Jean, we're running a little bit of time. Um, I'll just see if I can give you two minutes or so to, to summarize because we're kind of in time. Sorry, Papa Jean. Uh, Jordan, I would excuse myself as the moderator. Let me finish uh, and then I may not talk during the question time. Okay, yes, cheers. It all started and gradually probably added and certainly witnessed by the entire world. It culminated from bad to worse. The launch of the event was commemorated on the 2nd August 1998, which I witnessed personally as my house was bombed in the heart of Kinshasa at 1400, 03 minutes and 37 seconds. I lost everything and I had to flee. For today, I came here to submit the many questions that assault my mind day and night. Are we human? Are you immune to the suffering, to the cries, the desperation, the blood wasted, the young lives lost? Maluku, they were young people protesting against the atrocities committed by the government. The world may choose to look the other way and find a pretense for it, but I will never forget it. I hope you will not either. Tell me, are we just going to sit back, watch the Congo side or the Congo host or the Congo coast in silence or continue to cry alone without even attempting to face the extinction of our brothers and sisters? Are we going to stand by and do nothing? Or are we endlessly going to mop and speak about it, but do nothing? Just to sit and watch and hope that someone else take up the gauntlet. Are we so weak that we are not prepared to share our common burden of uplifting ourselves out of misery, save our families, protect our vulnerable parents, our sisters and mothers, our future generation. As Africans from the Congo, what satisfaction is there to just speak endlessly without finding a solution? Are we going to leave a broken nation to our children? Or are we willing to address and find a solution to peacefully reclaim our freedom, our right to live, our identity, our humanity, our childhood, womanhood, and manhood for the sake of our future? I have realized that our best asset as a community is to join our weakened hands together but still with a long, strong will. We need to do everything in our power to support each other. We must organize ourselves constructively and with a strong purpose. Join me in thanking wholeheartedly those who have supported us. We salute those incredible donors, friends and families who have helped to support those in need during the food parcel campaign. From experience, we obviously have things to learn. What can we do? Sorry, what must we do? What do our African brothers here 
in the Congo expect us to do? How can we rebuild the broken trust, the neighborly love that we share with our neighbor country, respect and accept each other as human, capable of peace, love towards each other? I take this opportunity to invite you, yes, each one of you, my brothers and sisters, please join the Right to Live Africa mobilizing effort that will unite us both across South Africa and globally in order to change the ongoing atrocities into positive change that are taking place. We ask that the new administration in the Congo take a stand against what is happening. But above all, let us keep alive from now on the candle of remembrance and hope wrapped up in this phrase, lest we forget. What happened, and I'm going to finish, in the recent or remote past must bind us in the awakening movement that will achieve, set off a treasured much needed peace, a stable developed future for all of us in our beautiful Mama Congo, as well as in Mama Africa. I call Congo my mama. It's nurtured me. For me today is a new day. The priority going forward must be formulate a new role model for men, women driven by common values. A step-by-step -step approach is called for. One such step is an actionable plan to take a census of the Congo population to establish one of the basis of good governance. Our children are born stateless with no citizenship. It may have taken the will of a single man to bind together different ethnic groups on a single territory on the 1st August 1885. Today we are aged 135 years and one day. It also took one man to melt the differences of these groups in a United Nation in the 70s. So if they could, if they could do it, why can't we? This will, the, will lead us to card and enable us to a new identity. Thank we you, Sean. Dialogue. We need Thank a you, new Sean, dialogue. Thank you, Sean, for follow up. We're going to have to wrap up now. We're quite over. <laughs> Do you want to finish your last sentence? Because we're now Let's, half an hour. Okay. A united voice will be, in, a, in my view, one of the keys that will unlock the potential in us and so take us back to normality, to a respected and proud identity, a nation to be admired for rising from its ashes, and a new dialogue is really needed. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Jean. Um, we're now going to actually go straight to the poetry. Um, we would have been making our final closing remarks now. It is 8.30 in South African time. Um, so um, apologies to everyone for it running over. If you are able to stay on the program, um, then please do um, carry on listening. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to go straight to Prince Shapiro. Um, it actually is a perfect bridge because um, the poem that he's going to recite, I nickname it Mama Africa. Um, today, he has retitled it Congo We Cry. So, please, Prince Shapiro, who's originally from South Africa, but now in New York, I'm going to hand over to you. Are you ready? Yeah, I am ready. Okay, take the floor. Yeah. At first, you know, I will give thanks to the speakers of uh, today. Uh, I believe that uh, they are, their words, you know, will make it to our uh, cultural enlightenment of the people. Because what we say, we say what the people are saying. And I also like uh, the, the, the idea of uh, the revival of Ubuntu, because that is what is lacking in the governments that we have in Africa and, and, and all over. And also the idea of revival of Pan-Africanism. 
Yeah, the title of my piece today is uh, uh, Congo, We Cry. And uh, it goes like so. Let us state that that about Congo, refreshing our reminiscences about Zaire's recurring genocides, a tributary of the same Africa's river of agony, land loaded with enormously treasured minerals, cassiterites, cobalt, coltan, diamond, gold, rubber, tourmaline, uranium, wolframite, and many more of some we don't even know. Congo remains our beloved country, yet a fading dwelling palace of familiar faces, the Congolese, our troubled, trendy community. This is the journey of our boggled minds. We ride as sons and daughters of the soil on memories of dust blessed with natural resources. Stroll it with us from here and beyond. It is, the, it is a pain painting, walking and walling. Now imagine our tears tarnishing panels painting on window panes of Berlin conference room through which we watched and witnessed our country becoming a property of Belgium, the beginning of our ecological shame for crime, insecurity, rape, burning, looting, various vicious violations of recurring violations, atrocities materializing around minerals. Cogitate this. Our country was once a paradise where we cherished our families like Cheruban, a community so pleasant and full of sacredness. Gone are the days of wonderful ceremonies. Now talking about our country, hearing about our family, looking at our community makes me want to cry. I feel the dead coming alive. Even deathbed will never, never ever silence their voices. From dust depth, they connect and lament. Congo, we cry. Yes, good people, in respect of time, I will just do that one piece. Thank you very much, Prince Shapiro. That was beautiful. I'm now going to pass it over to Mubarak Simba, and he's going to be sharing his poetical piece, which contributes to our Jenna Costa. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Um, I said to all the speakers, I deeply enjoyed um, the insightful lesson. Uh, I will kick off then with the poem. Um, a lot of the inspiration came from Jean, I must say, sorry, from the time I met Ubab Jean the first time uh, to even the speech now as well. Africa is shaped like a gun and Congo is its trigger. If that explosive trigger bursts, the whole of Africa will explode. France Fanon. Trigger, a bullet in the bosom of the kaleidoscopic crystal in the crown of Kemet. Mwene Congo, the land was left orphaned and heartless without the harp that held your heartbeat. Trigger, a bullet in the womb 
from Bata of Queen Lukweni, the dye of the divine feminine whose phenomenal form flowered a fluorescent kingdom, whose sullen, whose sullen soul soaks in sequili. From the time he became Juan, they religiously raped, capitalizing on every cosmological constellation at its core for the colors that pour from its opulent ore. Trigger, boom, bash, crashed the calabash that carried life from Kwanzaa, a punctured lung, an amputated life supported by absent limbs, looted labor, galvanized in greed, plated grief, tabulated tyranny. May every curse ever chanted by the tongue of infinity be upon that demon. <laughs> Sorry about that. Please, everyone, mute their mics. Trigger. It's the 17th of January. Satan spat to cement his seat as blood beamed at our hero's feet. Did you not for a minute think that the spirit of Patris will ever defy defeat? May the colonial cancer lose sight by the boiling bright Lumumba light, the stellar knight whose arms, whose army's armor will set a light truth torch upon the perpetual path whose blossoms bleed ma'at, trigger, a choir of cowards, a chorus of darkness, a melancholic massacre, a barbaric gang of instruments whose every chime is a conscious crime, trigger, secret, secret, secrete, superluminal circles, return to Abemkulu, Bekemu, Unearth your tomb, Bakemet, Bakongo. That's the end of my first piece, um, inspired uh, by the quote by Fanon, as well as, as I said, my interaction. No, no, Baba, Babjan. I don't know if time permits for the second piece or not. Can I get an indication from the moderators? The second piece is, is about 30 seconds long, pretty oh, much. Okay. <laughs> yes. Pardon? Yes, if it's short, that's fine. Am I, am I audible? Yes, you are. All right, <laughs> all right. I'll, 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 read, I'll read through it. This poem is, is a published uh, um, poem in the book, Deaf Poets Inc. and by the same title, Deaf Poets Inc. Africa fills her beautiful eyes with tears in agony that has mastered her children and overwhelms her turbulent emotions. Yes, she is a queen for she gave birth to nations of royalty and warriors. Her crown is so beautiful, a bright light came from it that blinds the eyes of those who wish to be led by the spiritually dead. Her crown had colorful gems and precious minerals, a masterpiece crafted by nature's green hands. This amongst many wonders made her planet Earth's beauty spot. I pity her as devilish dictators roamed her kingdom like killer locusts flying over her golden crop that left her children staring into the face of famine and five fearsome curses. The greedy man swallows her multi-carat wealth and feeds her leaders the apple-poisoned politics. These leaders married their women to brutality and clothed them in thick garments of pain. These leaders stole the wholesome future from their infants' mouths. 
and fill their tiny, soft, innocent hands with man's greatest invention, the machine gun, to harden their hearts, ensuring that her fertile soil is washed in the priceless blood, but still her foot soldiers cannot rub their eyes to clear their vision, blurred by concoction of pretty propaganda, empty pride, falsehood, and toxic morals, this mixture labeled to make a civilized citizen with a strong sense of culture. Thank you very much, Mubarak. Um, I, yeah, I'm speechless, both of you are amazing. Um, just to let you guys know, I've got some children that are playing outside, so if you hear some noise, sorry about that. Um, I'm going to now share a piece. Um, I did have two, but I'm just going to pick one because of the time. Um, and as it's a global platform, um, this one that I'm going to share is called Intimidation Immigration. And I wrote this in 2016. The immigrant learns to put his ego in his pocket, leave a pride on the side and eat humble pie. Didn't come here to override, just take it all in a stride. Stride, oh how she had to stride. Calls from overseas, never seen trees as green as these. The grass is always greener. Laying in the grass, she watches the birds make sky circles of freedom, the stars. She just wants to work with you together. Didn't come here to take your women, just try to make a living. Calls to send money home, they're struggling. Cried, oh how he cried alone in his room, alone in his bed with a hunger in his tummy. Didn't come here to tell you better or to convince you for a visa. She came here for her soul. See, she was fleeing genocide, raping her to her bones. But now she's sucking on bones, trying to make ends meet. She has a bachelor, a doctorate, but will you recognize that? You've decided cleaning your sheets is what she's worth. So now she's a, so with a bachelor, she's a bachelorette and nobody really knows her. Didn't come here to divide and conquer. He'd do anything to make your day better. Hard graft, that's what he knows. Smile while you die, someone's got to do it. Put bread on the table for his family and five. Hasn't seen daylight for nine years. Still, he wipes away his tears. He says of sweat for the five to nine days. Where the real proof in the pudding lies is in the conspiracy of lies. The powers that be tell you to push away the foreigner, feed you the exact recipe that they know in your state. You can't help but eat. And as you chew, you secretly enjoy feeling better than them. For a moment you believe it. But do you taste what lingers? Do you smell before you taste? It's fear. They feed you fear. Your inner, fed, your inner fears are fed by his stories on repeat, on repeat, on repeat. The dress is tearing at its seams. He cries, blood tears. What when you fall in love, but the land has invisible borders? See the world apartheid. They don't want you to be together. Harder and harder they make it for couples. One has to earn a certain amount of bread and butter. Or maybe you can live, but not work. Or you have to tell me what underwear she's wearing. So they didn't come here to terrorize, but them you despise. Them, they make you demonize, making their and your actions legitimized. You're sold a pack of lies when you buy your daily news, but instead there has always been migration. But you have the right to interrogation.
Who has more right to be where? Who owns the air? Will you make us pay to drink from the spring, a tax to put up my umbrella? As the rain streams, you won't hear sweet drops, but screams. Stand up, wise up, voice up for the humankind, world citizen. Didn't come here, didn't come here. It's not like that here. Didn't come here, didn't come here. I'm shedding tears. So now I'm going to go to our last piece for the evening. And this is Tim Moanda. He is from the DRC. And um, he shared at the open mic night that we did for um, Genocost, which was on Friday the 13th of um, March. This was the last live event that um, that I did and, and that many people were a part of um, before the lockdown here in uh, South Africa. So, Tim Miranda, are you ready? Tim, are you ready? Sorry. Yes, I'm ready. Yes. Beautiful. Okay, you can All take right. the floor, my man. This is a piece that I did um, from a Congolese perspective of South Africa. So I just hope you will like it. I was born free in a new democracy and raised in a place where it's a miracle to reach adulthood. The term free bothered me because I always felt as if we never really possessed it. So growing up, I became obsessed with trying to find the true meaning of freedom and what it means for people to be free. Because at school, I was taught of the benefits of democracy, but crime, abuse, and poverty were the terminologies that I associated with democracy. These terminologies have prevented me and my community from truly being free, which is why I believe there is no freedom or democracy. I'm not free. You're not free. We're not free. We're not free because we have too many fathers and not, we're not free because we have too many fathers and not enough daddies taking care of their families. If we gather these men, we could make a major league because a lot of them are great at home running. We're not free because women in this country live in fear of abuse. Every time I scroll down or turn on the news, there's another hashtag in a body bag or a family singing the blues. We're not free because the rich believe we need more police on our streets to jail crime, but won't take the time to find out why I'm a criminal. We're not free because kids have no access to classes yet graduate with crime degrees because criminals are better, teach better than those with degrees. The modules are both mathematical and practical. For example, add bullets in a gun and choose one. Subtract a life or divide two legs. And if you do this, your rank gets multiplied. We're not free because when I reached puberty, my mom has to sit me down to talk about the birds and the bees and explain to me how I'm born with clipped wings because that's what being black means and how at any time or place I could be gone. We're not free because young girls from bankrupt homes can't afford to study on their own. So her only options are get a student loan or attract investors to have sex with them. And after the transaction, she gets tested and finds out she's pregnant and contracted a sexually transacted investment. We're not free because I'm forced to live a double life. I have to split my personality from being Sepokazi from side C to Patricia when at school or the city. The fact is it's gotten so bad that I even bleach my accent skin just to fit in and not sound ratchet. We're not free because I stand behind the yellow line for a train that runs in African time. When it comes, I'm forced to break the law by boarding when full because catching train is like a proverb. You won't get it unless you ride between the carriage. I'm not free because we foreigners are seen as resource sucking bacteria that infect the job market with cheap labor. That's why we're doomed with xenophobia. I'm treated like a stepchild because I don't have your bloodline and living in a land that's not mine like an Israeli in Palestine, but you, you live in a house that's yours, but not yours because someone richer owns a title deed. If you check the proof of property ownership properly, you'll see it says belongs to Jane and Michael Dean. So you see, we're both foreigners just trying to survive and provide for our vital needs. 
I'm not free because democracy is an illusion of freedom. It's like a bird in a bird zoo that can eat, fly and nest, giving it the illusion that it's free without knowing that it's confined within a border. So after this poem, I want you to look around you and ask yourself if this is what it means to be free, because I don't agree it is. We need equity before equality, but who's going to listen to me? At 23, I'm supposed to be young, wild, and free. What do I know about life anyways? I know enough to know it's not supposed to be this way. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, very much for your contribution. Um, as, I know, as I know, we are running over time. We've, we were due to finish at 8.30 um, in South African time, uh, 7.30 in uh, UK time. But we're going to allow for another 15 minutes um, of a discussion and some questions. For those of you that can stay, however, we do understand if you um, need to go, um, then we completely understand. And that includes the speakers. If you have other engagements because of, um, the time has run over, then um, you have permission to leave. Um, however, we are opening the room now. So, um, um, I see there's lots of thank yous here for our poets. <laughs> um, so let's open the floor. Um, I know there was a question um, that came up with um, Jean, but we didn't, and, and for um, Kambale. Um, so we can open the floor now. And Joe can be the other person who is moderating as well with me. So could people please raise their hands if they want to ask a question so that we know? Now no one wants to ask any questions. Okay, Prince. Well, maybe there's already some questions in the Zoom chat, right? Because people did ask some questions there. So maybe you could pick one, um, Sylvester. That's for all three. Okay. Prince Shapiro had the question. Oh, yeah, I, I, I have a question on the uh, uh, United Nations issue. I'm just wondering if we really have confidence, you know, in the United Nations in terms of uh, resolving the challenges that we have in Africa. Because for years that we have known the United Nations, I don't remember of any, you know, solution that ATD has brought, you know, to our challenges. So I, I, I'm just wondering, you know, from the people out there, if we really have, you know, that confidence that United Nations can provide any solution. If you're still around, Kamala. Yes, um, and I think I did speak about the United Nations map mapping report, so I can discuss that. And it's important to put it in the context. Um, the United Nations mapping report, uh, while it was under the supervision of uh, the UN Human Rights Office happened for a reason. Now say the reason a little bit. Uh, this is the intro. In the wake of the discovery of three mass graves in the Eastern part of Congo in late 2005, uh, the United Nations first announced its intention to send the human rights team uh, to conduct a mapping exercise, right? So in 2005, three mass graves were found. And this was just a reminder that the crimes committed in the Congo hasn't been that way. From 2005 to 2010, researchers, Congolese and international, worked to map out 617 incidents that took place in the Congo, who were the most serious violation of human rights. What does that mean? They killed three people in a neighborhood is not the most serious violation of human rights. The bury 15 people, that becomes an important. So that's the context of it. Second, before the report was actually released, there was a huge campaign to block the report to be published, mainly led by Rwanda because the UN report implicated Rwanda for committing genocide if proven in court. And they did not want that report to come out. So the release of the report on October 1st, 2010, 
was a victory for the Congolese civil society, that they felt vindicated, that after decades of screaming, this is happening now, there is a legal framework that can be used and propositions to that. The challenge we have with the UN as a body is that the members of the UN Security Council supports nations that destabilize the Congo, particularly the United States and United Kingdom. They support Rwanda and they support Uganda. So anytime there have been reports to hold these nations accountable, they have blocked it. In my proposal, um, knowing the African context, I am clear that the tribunal that was created in Senegal to try Abre, the African courts, is a court that the Chadians today feel that justice was served. This is Africans leading the process, creating a court in Dakar, and that, that dealt with that case. So when there is a call, which is included in the report of an international tribunal uh, for Congo, the civil society is hoping that one, because the current government, there are people who are implicated in the report, they're actually in government as we speak, it's not possible for justice in the Congo to be um, delivered to the people, that an international tribunal has to be created. And my proposal have been Senegal, and I saw in the chat, we were going back and forth with uh, David and a few people uh, sharing that Ghana, you know, Accra, uh, could be a good place to have uh, this tribunal. But in the end, it will really be up to the Congolese people how they will deliver justice. And I doubt uh, many of us put faith in the United Nations as a bilateral institution to end the conflict. They've been there for two decades now, almost two decades now, and the conflict hasn't ended. Okay, um, I have a, um, thank you, Kambale. I have a question for 16th June Movement, and then Aliyah, can, uh, you had a question, and then you can also ask yours to Jean. <laughs> we can pass the baton. Um, so a question that's come up is, do you think it uh, may be possible to organize some sort of pan-African conference of civil societies, such as yours, and of those of other African countries? Um, so maybe you could elaborate on, on your input on that, and then Elia, you are welcome to ask Sean your question. Sure. You wanna... Um... You're kind of new line in front, sorry. Uh... I think it's a very good idea. Yeah. The problem, the problem that is likely to come about is essentially the problem of money. Because if you look at most of the Pan-African conferences that do happen, most of them essentially are comprised of AU, uh, African Union organized events, which is obviously political mm -hmm. leaders of countries, which often don't actually have the people's best interests at heart and sometimes are completely contrary to those interests. Uh, to organize one of, of different civil society organizations, you'd first have to pick who are the ones who can truly represent the people in those countries, because you can't send every single one. And what it might turn into is who actually has the money to go, which is a problem in itself. So it's, it's difficult. Um, and if you were to have one that was open to all, the question would be, how to fund it. So I think if it could be done, maybe through the African Union, if they could get some kind of external funding for it, it would be very good, um, especially to then maybe make overtures to those leaders who are actually there um, and to meet each other and to network and stuff. But uh, it's difficult. I think, yeah, I, I'm just thinking about um, how the Freedom Charter in South Africa, which our Bill of Rights is based on, how that came into effect. And literally, the ANC, which was the liberation movement at the t um, organization at the time, they went across the country and they asked people, what do you want for your rights? But it was very time consuming. And perhaps I, um, building on what um, Aiden said earlier, you know, we can use social media and the internet and we could put the survey to the people. What do you think are the most pressing issues that you think your representatives need to talk about? Um, and 
then it turns into a bit of a political system. But yeah, I think there needs to be multiple discussions happening. So one for civil society, one for um, uh, like within the political sphere, and then maybe one in like the commerce sector, something like that. Um, but it's a, it's a very complicated issue. And so I think it's not a single answer that we need like a, um, a multi-pronged kind of approach. And then my question is, um, it's a question for Jean or anyone else who wants to answer it. Um, what do you think South Africans uh, can do or people in other countries aside from the Congo can do to support Congolese people? Well, uh, first of all, I think it's uh, about the civil society that need to support the Congolese people. It's not about those that are in leadership because they are too much involved in the Congo. So if today, Alia, you say on your side that you're going to mobilize the South Africans that are driven by justice and human rights to come on board and support our cause, for instance, let me tell you, and uh, I have had that discussion with uh, Sly and many other people. In the Congo, we do not have an identity card. So we do not even exist in any system in the world. Because for me, a passport is not an identification. So for us, it's for those that are driven for peace, stability in any country that would come on board for a new dialogue, as you mentioned, that should divide. You have a dialogue with the politicians, not those who are involved in war, whom should be going to the tribunal to be tried, and then a dialogue with the Congolese. But also my call to us as Congolese is to be united because most of the time we speak in different tongues. That is one of the reasons that I've joined my uh, younger brothers with uh, this genocost because I would say, no, I've got my organization. It is important that we speak about those things. But if the cause is right, we need all to join and Africans need to come on board. The time Congo will yield pills that's the rise of Africa. Uh, I wanted to add one thing uh, about the UN. Do people remember that uh, there's one general secretary who died in the Congo? And until today, there has been no investigation, Doug Amas George. So when two uh, junior UN citizens died in the Congo, I'm sure there won't be any investigation, those who died in the Kasai, where the Kamuna Sap, when they killed millions of Kasai people, they were displaced. So Congo is a particular case that needs everybody to come on board, to stand a minute, let think, and let's create a new down for Congo. How? That's the question. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Um, Joe or Sylvester, did you have a burning question? Otherwise, I can take this one again. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, sorry, Joe. Um, I got one question I picked up from the floor. Uh, Beautiful, thank you. From MA. She asked, um, what can consumers do um, to help out um, with the issues in the Congo in terms of um, minerals, obviously? Uh, we all carry gadgets. What can we do to help reduce the exploitation of mineral, illegal mineral exploitation in the Congo? And that's for the flow. Um, anyone can pick that up. Right, right now in the United States, there is a law that was passed that, that actually makes it possible right now to trace the minerals, right? the Conflict Minerals Act that was included in the Dodd-Frank bill. So minerals are being certified as we speak as conflict-free. 
Rwanda is certifying minerals as conflict free, right? So I understand the approach of fair trade, but these processes until there is justice and peace will never work. Because as we speak, the law exists and companies can show you the certification that my coal tan, uh, my team comes from a specific place. And as I just mentioned, <laughs> Rwanda is certifying those minerals. Um, the approach in my view is not to have free trade, right? because we are removing the responsibility of the crimes that, that have taken place from the forces that committed the crime to a mineral. We're saying a mineral kills someone, then we need to certify it or figure out what it is. The issue that we have is Congo is under occupation, millions have died, and there is a culture of impunity. That sends a message to anybody who commits crime in the Congo that nothing will ever happen to them. So until there is justice, there will not be peace. And in order to have free trade, we must have justice. So to get justice, let's use framework to actually either put people in jail or any methodology that where the people themselves will feel that my family was killed, my uh, loved ones were buried alive, that they feel that justice has been served. Until there, there is justice, there will not be peace in Congo. Thank you, Kambele. Yeah. Um, Sylvester, did you have a question? That, I just um, wanted to ask two people with their hands raised. Sylvester, do you have a and uh, Francine? Okay. No, I just want to say um, thank you. And uh, maybe you can have a question. We have both Charlie and Francine. So maybe we can take uh, uh, Francine and then Charlie. All right. Could you hear me? <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you for this uh, event anyway. Uh, my question is to do with the uh, I mean, specifically Kambale and Jean, because they is to do with Congo, Congolese precisely. My question is this. I want you to ask about the mapping report, but I'm glad that Kambale already touched it because I know that without the justice, nothing's gonna change. Definitely nothing gonna, so Kambale is right. Anyway, my question is this. What is the role of Congolese government? Because I, when I was reading uh, uh, what happened in Bosnia, and then we know also the genocide in Bosnia and the government that took, uh, I mean, the, the present that government was in place, they play massive role basically for, for them to get justice and for the genocide in Bosnia to, to be recognized worldwide. So my question, I let face it, we all know that like, okay, we all know what's going on in Congo with the president's government and all coalition, all that, but they have a role to play. So if, for instance, the Congolese gov uh, uh, government are watching now, so if they ask you, what is advice could you give them? Because they have to play the role. There's a, we can't move forward. They, they have to be involved somehow. It's the same thing that's happened to Rwanda, the Rwanda government, were involved. So if they ask you Kambale, if they ask you Jean, uh, Chisekedi's government, what could we do for, I mean, for the mapping report to be obviously in practice? What would, advice would you give them? Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to um, offer this question to uh, Christian. I think he's been left out a bit and I think that he could um, I think, I think he's the right person to, to start with an answer for this, please. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Nina. I don't think it's a problem of the right person. I think uh, any of the speakers also could uh, answer to it. And, uh, but I will share my view. I will share my view. And um, I mean, the current situation in Congo is quite interesting. We have had that report since 2010, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the government that was at that time was obviously not willing, as uh, Kambali and uh, Jean has pointed out. We uh, had officials from the government that were kind of uh, involved due to the atrocities uh, that were um, reported. 
And now uh, the current government is uh, still the situation has now kind of fully changed. And uh, they, we, media is going kind of through a uh, transitional phase where we seeing some signs of, of, of the justice system becoming a little bit independent, but it's still not fully independent. So what the government could do, normally the government is the one to take that report, take ownership of the report, and start pushing for element of the report to be established, like one of them being that uh, 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 the prosecution of all those people who have been namely cited in the report as perpetrators of those uh, atrocities and massacres. Now, we couldn't have it in the past, because, like I said, because officials from the government were uh, involved. Uh, some of them, they're still, uh, we did the government nowadays. Now that's what I'm saying is a bit tricky. The only thing is, uh, I believe the government has first to liberate its own justice system when we have a very uh, independent and fully functional justice system in the DRC. That justice system will have all the means and tools necessary to push for that report uh, 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 to be uh, implemented, especially for the recommendations that were uh, given to the government. I think this is, this is kind of a gray area where the government is. The solution might not be found right now as we speak, but uh, let's see if things start improving on the justice system, probably will go into help some good news for, for all the victims. Uh, of the atrocities that were um, kind of investigated part of the mapping report. Yeah. Um, did um, Sean or Cambalo want to add to that at all? Or anyone else um, is also available to answer to, to contribute? Okay, uh, we must start with the premises. And uh, I think, uh, Kambale alluded to it uh, earlier on. Since 1961, when Patrice Semeri Lumumba was killed, we must say the truth here. We have not had a government chosen by the people of the Congo. So talking about a government means to me that we are talking about the irony of these elections. There was no elections. So I think it is very important that we as civil society, we take charge now. And we ask the brothers and sisters from Africa in the same way we did for South Africa in the 1970s and 80s until it culminated to your freedom in 1994. It is very important that you come on board and say enough is enough in the Congo. No more bloodshed because we are all brothers. If we wait for the government, I had a question for you, Christian. The current president said before elections that once he is elected between inverted comma, he would go and have his residence in Beni. Two years now, he's still not in Beni. The current president, when he came to South Africa, in my question was clear to him. Mr. President or candidate president then, when are we as Congolese going to have an identity card? The passport that we have is being done in Rwanda. Where is our independence? And those who hold the means for that passport, are people that we do not even know whether they're Congolese or not. I met them face to face. So why are we hiding the truth? This is the right place where we need to talk about the truth so that people understand the intricacies that are going in the Congo. There are missionaries, guns in the Eastern side of the Congo that exist nowhere else in Africa, but they are there and the MONUSCO is there. 
that people die every single day. Just the same way my mom was killed in 1960s. My father was killed in 1960s. Nothing has changed. There's no government since the killing of Patrice Emery Lumumba. Thanks Kambale for reviving that history where Lumumba was searching for the solidarity of all African in Ghana in 1958. Before that, he went also in Ibadan. So until we tell our story and we tell our history, then we will be liberated. And it is very important as one philosopher says, if we do not unlearn what we were forced to, to, to learn, then we are just as dead. Okay, uh, if I may just uh, in a very few words uh, answer to uh, what um, uh, Papa Jean said, but I'm still very keen to hear also Kambali on Francine's uh, Francine question, what the government should do as far as the mapping report is concerned. I don't know if you will be interested to, to add something on, that, on, on top of that. Um, uh, in very few words, uh, there's a huge difference between candid, uh, candidate Sekedi and President Sekedi. Even if he did say he will move and establish himself in the Eastern part, it hasn't happened because it was clearly uh, uh, advised by the military official that this is not the right time. They cannot provide 100% security for him. That's part of the reason why he hasn't uh, uh, moved his uh, official residency that site. Now, as far as the ID document uh, are concerned, I can I can guarantee you that there is work in the pipeline. Uh, these uh, documents will be issued to all Congolese before the second round of elections scheduled for 2023. Yeah, thanks. Brother, you're putting and me. Professor, or, um, oh, oh, sorry, who was the other person that was asking a question after um, the lady? We are Charlie. Charlie, I guess. Charlie, beautiful, thanks. Okay, sorry for that one. Though. Yes, hello. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you first for for the time that you guys will give us and for the organization. Even even though I just come late and then I already listening to what people that was talking on the opinion, so I get some stuff. So I just want to ask some question. I know it's for a long time that us Congolese was not to believe in even one day our country is going to be up or maybe a justice is going to be right on the way that they, our new president is going with the staff. is uh, going with uh, other thing that is only showing on the world that the thing is going to is going to going right. So the only question that I want to ask, so which advice other countries because our in the round of Congo there is a nine countries that they are around us. So which advice other people from other countries they're gonna give us like to motivate to motivate us for us to going forward in hundred percent. So is that one my question? I'll leave that open to anybody who wants to answer then. I didn't understand this question. Can you repeat it? I'm sorry. I did not fully understand. Okay. Or maybe if, um, maybe if Charlie, you're a bit shy in English, you're welcome to speak mm -hmm. in um, another language, if you like, directly to Congolese community, if you feel more comfortable. I say, my question is this. We have nine, nine countries that they are around us, ne? They are around Congo. So my question is, which advice those countries who maybe other countries from Africa, which advice they're gonna give us for us to going forward to, to support our government in 100% and our president for our country to be up? Is that one my question? So you must say the... Could, sorry. Um, so, would you like to answer? Could, um, if, if, if you if you if I may, 
um, real quick, you know. His, his, his question is very pertinent. So if I may rephrase it, or if I may repeat what he said, he's saying that there is, there apparently is hope that things might get better in the Congo. However, he wants to know what advice do the other nine countries that are neighboring the DRC would have in terms of the transformation of the DRC, which in, by implication also, what contribution do they have in, in whatever diplomatic form or military that would help this um, reformation or transition, you know, to peace in the DRC. That's what I understood, okay? So just a, a small point of emphasis is that the, my, my biggest belief is that we need to double up on uh, uh, Baba John's and I think June 16th uh, concept of civil rights movement, okay, or the civil, civil society, right? Yeah. Because we know, we, we need to look at the pattern. We need to look at the pattern. In America, right, uh, there was a creation by, by the American government to dismantle a civil rights society. The same thing has happened in Africa repeatedly. How many of the African presidents were dismantled not by going to fetch some special forces in China. They came to best friends of the presidents to come in there. So for me, the, 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 the contribution from those nine countries cannot happen in that system. There's a system error. So for as long as we're looking for an African solution in a Western system, Africa will always collapse. Afri uh, in, that, in that doubling up of the civil society, we need a secret society, just like um, a lot of the decisions that destroyed Africa happened behind closed doors. We need closed doors where no one knows what the movement or the advancement of people that want to liberate Africa are, and we only see the effect of it. That's, that's my, I don't know if I went off a trajectory or not, but that's, uh, that would be my response to the brother. As long as we're looking for a solution in the Western construct, there's no hope for Africa. We'll perpetually stay in the cycle. The minute a leader rises, he'll be assassinated. The minute someone is doing something that's uh, having an effect on their pocket, they'll be, they'll be removed. So it needs to be secret. Um, I'll open it up for someone else. Um, if you can be brief within uh, one, two minutes, and then I'm going to pass it over. I want to respond to the second one. Um, I think specifically from Africans, um, Africans must know the truth about what is happening in the Congo in a very concrete way. Uh, for the, in the case of South Africa, it's even important for South Africans to actually know what's happening in the Congo. Very good one example. 2011 elections, South Africa printed the ballot box. South Africa flew the ballot box from South Africa to the Congo. South Africa monitored the election and that was a rigged election. The ballot box arrived in the Congo with the results. There are many reports on that. There was no outcry inside of South Africa about the 2011 election, right? And I can go on even about the neighbors where Zambia right now has taken over the town of Moba in the south. Angola is controlling the southern part of the Congo. But the people of those countries do not know what the governments are doing. So building a people solidarity, the All African People's Conference that took place in 1958 was the beginning of that. We had the African Union and Kwame Krumah felt it important that we couldn't have the African Union by itself as government's entity meeting, but we needed to have an all African people's network. That's how uh, the Mumbai arrived. Where is the all African people's network where Congolese today can reach out to African brothers or sisters in their country and for them to know what is happening? If we have that, it will address the issue of neighboring countries where their citizens will hold the government accountable if they are attacking the Congo in any shape or trying to destabilize it. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Sylvester or or um, Joseph. So we're not going to take uh, one more question from uh, the floor. So I see many stick you had your, your hands up, and then after that we'll be wrapping up. 
Beautiful. Okay, thank you. You can take the question, Monique. Can you hear us? Oh. Hello? Yes, speak, Monique. Oh, okay. I heard Monique, so I thought it was somebody else. Um, I think uh, somebody has answered my question. Uh, I was just going to highlight on Kambale said we need uh, justice first, uh, but in the same time, I think that the enemies of Congo, they're after whatever makes them money. So as consumers or activists or anyone who's been uh, bringing awareness about what is happening in Congo, uh, what can we practically do like from today or in our lifestyle, uh, even if we're not in a, we're not, uh, going to an event or moving, uh, adjoining any um, network uh, event. What can and what can we do individually that can impact uh, the justice? Uh, I used to talk with my friends that oh, the constitution needs to be changed because it needs to be done by Congolese, not by the colonizer and things like that. So it was, but I I do understand. Um, like, uh, somebody say that there's a lot of category that we all have to uh, sit down and work on them, whether it's capital or um, or, or politics and things like that. I, I did get my, my answer. Oh. Yeah, that was it. Thank you very much. Um, well, we are now coming to the end of, of the program. I would like to thank you, thank all of our guest speakers and poet and artists for coming today. We really appreciate you coming and for so long, way over our time. Um, I would like to also thank all of our participants for coming on this very important day to join us uh, in solidarity to commemorate and remember um, the people who are died in Congo and talk about the current ongoing genocide that is happening. So um, I also want to take this opportunity to um, have a word, if I may say, to, um, to our fellow Congolese, uh, not to underestimate um, the number of allies and friends that we do have. Uh, we often feel like we're fighting this war by ourselves, and we are not. Today, you can see there is plenty of our friends from all across the world that have joined us on this platform, um, that have contributed, that have supported, that have taken the time, uh, even for Genocor to happen. You know, I appreciate Nina, who's not a Congolese, who's taken the time and effort to be hosting this event in South Africa, uh, in collaboration with us, of course. And I want you to know that wherever you are, no matter how small you are, you can do something, you can share a story, you can reach out to someone. As Aiden mentioned before, when people get to know you as a human being, you can win an ally, you can win a friend, and you should not underestimate that. I apologize for my... You are muted. Sorry, you're muted. Sorry, I was just saying, sorry, if my daughter was speaking back there. So I was just saying thank you once again, everybody, for coming. Thank you to our friends, to our sponsors. We stand in solidarity. And let's go and win more friends to be able to put an end to this misery. Let's just not fight this by ourselves because there's many out there that are willing to help. Thank you very much, everybody. I wish we had more opportunity like this. We can always meet again next year, make it better, make it bigger. Um, someone requested for some of the artists out there, if it was possible to maybe share some of your piece of poetry that we can put it on our page. Uh, if you may be able to coordinate with Nina, that would be nice because some people felt really moved by it. Um, and uh, we will try to populate our website in the next couple of days with more information for you guys. Thank you for following us. Thank you again for coming. And I wish you all a great evening. Thanks for having us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you.